Welcome to people as you're just joining us. It's a, it's a cool, slightly foggy day in, uh, in Cardiff at the moment. So we're just going to let, let a couple more minutes go by just so that people can find their computers, turn it on, come in from morning visits or whatever it is that people have been doing this morning. Hopefully grab a cup of tea or a drink of water or something and sit down at the computer. But we are recording this webinar as we have with all of our previous webinars so that if you have to bash out or if you've been trying to join us but actually clinical events have meant that you couldn't join us then you will be able to access the recordings later on and it's interesting isn't it sometimes at the time you, you you're involved with a patient and then perhaps you might come across some of the issues again two or three weeks later or even a little bit later and so of course you have got the scope of looking at the recordings and and looking at them sometimes with colleagues and discussing so the whole purpose of this series of webinars is really, again, to, to reimagine our face-to-face -face short course, just because at the moment, as we all know, clinical working is very complicated and very busy, and especially in this run-up to Christmas time. So it was just felt that it was easier to bring people together online. A, we could record the sessions, but for some of you, if you've been to any of the, the, the previous two sessions, you'll know that we will stay on the line at two o'clock. So we will stay on the call at two o'clock. If at that point there's anything particular around symptom, symptom control for patients who've got, particularly this week, breathlessness, constipation or delirium that you want to ask a particular question about, then do please feel free to stay on the line. We won't record that section of the webinar, though. We can stay online till about half past two. Um, but if there are particular questions you want to ask, then please stay on and, and ask them at that point. Usual rules around patient confidentiality and colleague confidentiality, but we'd be pleased to, to discuss clinical cases if that will be helpful. Um, we are extremely appreciative of people's feedback for these webinars. What's useful? What will you use in your clinical practice? And so at the end, just about around about two o'clock, there will be a QR code. Please do complete it on that. Then with your name on that, that will then generate your CPD certificate for having attended the event. But it's terribly important for us to know how useful the information is and what difference it's going to make. And that will help us then be able to plan for webinars for the future. Anyway, enough from me. I'm Fiona Rawlinson, for those of you who don't know me, but I'm part of this great collaboration um, for these webinars. So this is a real collaborative effort funded by Cardiff and Fell and the End of Life Board. And we've got representation from Cardiff University with Charlotte Stevenson and myself and Joe Hayes with a university hat on. We've got Marie Curie Panath which is Lisa and Joe Hayes and Elaine McLeish has been instrumental in the planning of the sessions and we've got City Hospice. So we've got today, we've got James Davis and Katriona Seed. And the topics we're talking about today are breathlessness, constipation and delirium, but all with a focus on the district nursing input for the care of this palliative care patient. So Palliative care delivery is it's definitely a team effort, isn't it? We need to do it in collaboration with all of us. So everybody's views and viewpoints is terribly important. As we start, it's just quite useful for us to know who's in the room. So we've got just a couple of polls and thank you, Julia, for putting you and, and saying that Rebecca is with you. And just thank you for also reminding me to say to everybody, the chat is functional, so do please feel free to um, add comments or questions or reflections in the chat and we can pick them up as we go through. So, um, Charlotte, I wonder if we could um, do the do the polls, if that would be OK. So we'd like you just to say what's your what's your main role, just so that we know who's on the call. That's that's the first thing. And everybody is welcome. I should have said that at the start. Yes, these are our series aimed for, for, for with our district nursing colleagues, but everybody is welcome. 
terribly important to understand what everybody what everybody else's perspective is on the care of a patient. That's lovely. OK. So, Charlotte, have we got uh, my screen looks slightly different to yours? Have we got people's input on that? Yeah, we should. You should be able to see it. So we've got fourteen percent district nurse, forty-three percent palliative care team, and forty-three percent nurse. Wonderful. Thank you. And we've got one more poll, I think, if I remember rightly, and I can see it now if I scroll. If I scroll down. So then, just again, what setting do you work? That will just help us just to pick up questions if we're not addressing, if we're not addressing things. Lovely. That's wonderful. OK, that's great. So mainly specialist palliative care, but also we've got mainly community and a mixture. Wonderful. OK, thank you very much indeed. That's great. That gives us a real feel for who's in the room. We may well be joined by others joining us, but I think without more ado, I think we should get going and start to think about some of these challenging symptoms and how we manage them. So first up is Joe Hayes from Marie Curie. And Joe, you're going to tackle delirium, I think. The floor is yours. Thanks, Fiona. Can you hear me OK? All good. Yes. Great. Thank you. And can you see the first slide, everyone? Yes, um, we, yes, yes. we can. Yes, we I was can. just going to think about a patient, really, or somebody that we might see to just just get us in the zone of thinking about this. So I think confusion or delirium is a really common instance. No, I don't know whether anybody else is having an issue, but I can't hear you. I, okay. I can hear you. I can hear you. OK. Oh, I, apologies. I can, I can hear you. OK, Joe. OK. No apologies. Apolog Sorry, James. Um, so, yes, people who are confused or who have delirium is a really common instance within our palliative care patient population and something that we would deal with quite often. And I know that it's something that my district nursing colleagues would deal with quite often for the people that they're seeing in the community. So I thought it might be helpful. Just think about a patient. So Mike, he's got prostate cancer with bone secondaries not for further anti um, systemic anti-cancer treatment, but has been reasonably OK, less mobile, quite edematous, but does manage to sort of have useful chats with his friends who come and visit and can go out in his wheelchair with his wife. But now, over the last couple of days, has got fluctuating confusion um, and his medicines include slow release morphine at a 30 milligrams twice a day dose there and dexamethasone, which is a steroid at one milligram per day. So that's Mike, just to bear him in mind. OK. So conf acute confusional state or delirium, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what that is. Um, characterised by disturbed consciousness, Difficult perceptions, sort of brain not working properly, if you like, is probably the best way of thinking about it. And the picture there um, is from a Royal College of Psychiatry presentation on somebody's sort of artist's impression of what delirium might look like. Um, you know, fever dreams is another another way of thinking about it, perhaps where you you you're not very well, have a high temperature, and have really weird dreams. I think delirium is perhaps something where that that isn't just in your sleeping state and comes into reality where you're misperceiving what's actually happening, what you're actually seeing or what you're actually hearing. And some of the misperceptions can be can be quite pleasant um, and people can appear, can appear fairly pleasantly confused, but sometimes that can be quite distressing, can be scary things, sort of images of death, spiders, um, people that have died, people in the corners of your vision and that sort of thing. So one of the features of delirium, it's it can, can come on quite acutely and have a fluctuating course, so it's not always the same. Sometimes people are reasonably OK, especially during daylight hours, and at other times they can be really quite confused and muddled, commonly as daylight fades, sort of known as sundowning, I guess, where, where as, as the light goes, people do get quite muddled. So I think as a doctor, um, you you sometimes don't get quite 
the impression of what people are really like if you only see them during the day or you only see them on a ward and then you'll come in the morning and the nurses will say I had a really really terrible night and you'll have a look at the person that they they've been very concerned about they'll be fast asleep in their bed they'll sleep all morning a sort of wake up about lunchtime would be absolutely fine and you won't quite realize what they're what they're like at night um delirium is quite a, a serious serious condition and is associated with quite poor outcomes sometimes depending on whether you can find a treatable or reversible cause. Um, so how do we know if people have delirium or cognitive impairment? So I'm going to go through the differences between the two in a minute but the, the 4AT test is, is really quite a useful screening test and it only includes those four questions there or the four four things that you have to think about. So is the person that you're looking at sort of fully alert, mildly sleepy or clearly very drowsy? Can they tell you their name, date of birth, place, current year? Can they do the months of the year backwards, which is harder than you think and requires a degree of concentration? Um, and is this acute or fluctuating? There's lots of other things that you can use. Drawing a clock face can be quite indicative of whether someone has the ability to concentrate and to put that on a piece of paper. And there are lots of other questions that you can ask. Who's the prime minister? You know, who's the person in Buckingham Palace that reigns over us all? But you do have to, you know, realise that lots has changed recently. And people that are elderly and have only known the Queen, you know, might be a little bit forgetful about who it currently is. And with the Prime Minister, I think we all might be quite forgetful about who it currently is if the last few months are anything to go by. Um, so just to talk about delirium, acute confusion versus dementia or cognitive impairment. I've said quite a few times already that delirium can be quite acute and is fluctuating changing depending on what day it is or what time of day it is um, whereas dementia or cognitive impairment is is always there and tends to progress and doesn't change particularly much as the day goes on patients with dementia or cognitive impairment tend not to be drowsy hallucinations are not normally a big feature whereas in in delirium or acute confusion hallucinations, hearing things, seeing things can be a big part of that. Um, people often can't give you coherent speech if they have delirium, whereas they may well be able to with dementia, even if it doesn't particularly make sense. And people with delirium or an acute confusional state are often quite aware of what's happening to them and quite anxious about it, whereas dementia later on, you may not be particularly aware. That's just another method of diagnosing delirium, really, the confusion assessment method where you have to have features of A and B. And A is things like acute and fluctuating inattention, disorganised thinking and altered levels of consciousness where you might well be quite drowsy or very difficult to rouse. I'm not going to dwell on those. Um, yeah, beware misdiagnosis. You can have delirium, which is hyperactive or agitated and restless, hypoactive where you're withdrawn and quiet and quite sleepy and that can be more difficult to pick up. So you have to sort of you know wake people up and actually have a conversation with them to realise sometimes and you can have features of both but people can also appear confused when they're not really. They might just be anxious, they might just be disorientated because they're on lots of different medicines, they might not be able to see or hear you properly. Um, and they might be having sort of vivid dreams and be a bit, little bit disorientated about whether they're awake or asleep. So this concept of a delirium threshold, which can be quite useful. Um, it's, I think you think about it a bit like a seizure threshold, I suppose, where your how prone you are to delirium um, varies according to all these things. So if you're very young or very old, you're much more prone to delirium. So I'm sure you've all seen sort of children that have got high temperatures and get a bit delirious and don't quite know where they are if they're poorly. And, you know, elderly people, if they have something like a urinary tract infection, often get a little bit confused and muddled, whereas people who are sort of young and fit and in their 20s, 30s, if they get a UTI, they can be quite unwell, but don't necessarily become confused. So age affects your delirium threshold. 
dementia and learning disabilities also. So we talked about the difference between dementia and things like delirium. Um, but you, off, you obviously could have dementia and then delirium on top and it's just like acute on chronic confusion and be sometimes quite difficult to distinguish. We've also talked about people that can't see or hear properly um, being more prone to delirium and that's because it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to know what's real. So changing environment, we're all very familiar with um, if you take people who might be frail and elderly out of their usual and very familiar environments that can precipitate confusion. And familiar and excessive stimuli, anyone that has spent time in hospital where the light, the bright lights are on 24-7, it's noisy 24-7, people slam the bins 24-7 and then at four o'clock in the morning someone will move you from one hospital bed to another um, because, because uh, you know, they need, they need the bed and they're trying to improve the flow around the hospital. People who've had delirium are more prone to it again. People with other mental health disturbances such as depression are more prone to it. And people, I put alcohol abuse there, but I guess anybody who's dependent on alcohol or any other sort of medicines um, may be more prone to a withdrawal type symptom that, syndrome that can give them delirium. And also, you know, alcohol uh, in itself can cause a sort of confusional state. And I've said already that people who are frail, so who've got reduced performance status and difficulties in maintaining mobility and managing their own activities of daily living would be more, more prone to delirium. So delirium precipitated by the disease itself, whatever it is that's wrong with you. And lots of people have got lots of different things wrong with them, lots of comorbidities treatment itself so if it's cancer related could be chemo or radiotherapy or medicines um, treating whatever it is that's wrong with you could be due to general debility so being prone to infections constipation dehydration all goes along with frailty really and not being very mobile and maybe incapacitated and there's concurrent stuff that's going on and maybe not related to the illness or the disease or the episode that's going on at the moment but if you have a history of dementia or cognitive impairment or drug and alcohol um, use or previous head injury um, that can can make you make you more prone to delirium and there's a mnemonic there um, about some of the common causes okay so if we think about mike who had prostate cancer bone metastases um, was seven in his 70s, I think, um, and becoming more frail, really, with reduced mobility and needing to use a wheelchair. He was also on opioids and was also on steroids. And so I guess those are some of the potential causes that could be important for him. So in prostate cancer with bone secondaries, he could possibly have a high calcium causing delirium. He could have renal impairment and some of the prostate cancer patients would get some obstructive um, renal disease and, and therefore um, damage to their kidneys from, from the obstruction. He may well have an infection such as a urinary tract infection and would be more prone to those, but could also have any other type of infection really, like a chest infection bringing about um, delirium, you know, and certainly could be, could be dehydrated. Um, we talked about his morphine that he was on and opioids can cause confusion and delirium. But if he's been on a stable dose for some time and there's been no change in things like his kidney function, it would be unlikely to be the morphine. And morphine's often sort of blamed as a cause for confusion. So with the steroids, similarly, steroids can cause a sort of acute confusional state and lots of you will have heard of steroid psychosis which is more common than you think but steroids can also cause depression and low mood and can also cause delirium um, again it usually comes on quite soon after starting the steroid tablet so if Mike's been on them for quite some time and been absolutely fine on them then um, they may be less high up your list as a potential cause 
Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind with steroids is we haven't told you whether Mike's diabetic and he could be prone to diabetes. So steroids raising your blood sugars can also make you really unwell and cause delirium if that's not detected at all. So there's some of the potential causes with outpatient. Um, so I've said this already, opioids and confusion, if the dose has been stable, there's probably another cause unless renal failures occurred because morphine is, is excreted or got rid of from your body by your kidneys. So if your kidneys stop working properly, you start to accumulate things like morphine and that can, can make you confused. And there are other reasons there why um, you might be prone to delirium with opioids. So if you've if you've lost a lot of weight or are more frail than you were when you started that dose, if we've started other drugs that might be interacting, or if you've removed removed the painful stimulus that was making you need your morphine in the first place. So for example, if you had really painful bone secondary, um, but I had some radio palliative radiotherapy, which had re worked really well and taken the pain away, then you can sometimes get a little bit opioid toxic because you haven't got the pain stimulus that continues on. Okay, so how do we manage delirium? So in the same way that we might manage any other symptom, really, and we would identify a cause if we could, investigate and treat reversible causes appropriately, and then think about non-drug treatments and drug treatments. So we've talked about infections, look for infection, treat if appropriately, think about checking blood tests. So for blood count, for things like high white count and infection, kidney function, liver function, calcium, glucose. Um, consider whether people might be hypoxic because that can cause confusion. Have a look at all the medicines. Specific treatments such as steroids for brain metastases might help acute confusional states. Treating any sort of withdrawal with things like nicotine patches or perhaps benzodiazepines if you think someone was, is withdrawing from alcohol and relieve things like retention and impaction. So there would be your potential reversible treatable causes. That's not an exhaustive list, but that's some of the common ones. Okay. So no causes identified in over 50% of people with advanced cancer. And I think we're talking about district nurses here and people being in their own homes so I think we do need to think about where the most appropriate place of care is if you've got someone that's confused and that will depend on how acute the confusion is, how well they've been before, what their wishes have been and whether they've got family around that can help to look after them or whether they've got any care and whether you think there's something that might potentially be reversible. Therefore, there might be a reason to consider an acute admission. Um, it, depends, it depends on your circumstances. Also depends on whether this person um, retains capacity, really. So loss of mental capacity. Um, to not have capacity, you need an impairment of your mind or brain, um, which, you know, delirium um, is, is a symptom of that impairment, really. And you need to have the ability, inability to make the specific decision. So capacity is decision specific. So it depends what the decision is that you're asking people to make. It may be, do you want to go to hospital, um, for example? And to have capacity, you've got to understand the information you're being given, retain it, weigh up the decision that you're trying to make and be able to communicate your wishes and feelings. So if you don't have capacity, then we, we have to sort of try to make decisions that are in people's best interests um, and to help them make decisions if they can, to consult anybody who might be important. And their friends and families are very important in telling you what they might or might not have wanted and also in telling you what they can and can't do at home. If they do have an official lasting power of attorney for health, then it may be that they can make decisions on behalf of that person. If we're making best interest decisions, I'm sure you know we have to think about the least restrictive options. Um, and if we are taking somebody or keeping somebody in somewhere that they're saying they don't want to be, then there are safeguards and procedures to go through in terms of deprivation of liberty or dolls procedures. So non-drug measures to treat delirium, explain, see if you can talk about things that are making them anxious or frightened, 
keep calm don't confront people don't you know don't don't tell them that everything they've said is wrong and they must be really muddled in a confrontational way um and try to clarify some of the misperceptions so you know a clock a calendar um don't move them around the place maybe have a family member as a reassuring presence and try to look after them with familiar staff So for acute delirium, we probably want to avoid drug treatment for the delirium unless we thought it was absolutely necessary. And even then, only consider it for short term use and only if someone was really distressed or a danger to themselves. We would consider drug treatment if no cause could be found. And if we really thought that this person was terminally agitated, meaning they were very agitated or confused because they were in the last few days of their life, then that is a different situation and that may well require drug treatment. But what we would need in that case is a, a discussion of those involved with looking after this person and to try to decide if that's really what we thought the situation was. So it's sometimes quite difficult to tell. Um, but it's putting things within a trajectory of, you know, have they been gradually deteriorating? Um, and is this what we would expect at this point? Or if you go back to our patient, Mike, you know, yesterday or the day before he if he was um, up and about out in his wheelchair and chatting to his friends and it's quite an acute onset and that doesn't fit with terminal agitation. Okay. So what drug treatments might we use? Medicines like haloperidol levomopromazine sometimes but that can be quite sedative or sometimes antipsychotic medicines such as risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine in small doses and sometimes with help from our mental health colleagues in determining the best drug to use or the most appropriate dose. So we would sometimes use benzodiazepines so medicines like lorazepam, diazepam, midazolam um, but they don't actually treat the delirium as such. They're just sort of sedative and they can take the anxiety off, off sort of the way people are feeling. Um, but they don't necessarily remove, remove the delirium as such. And sometimes um, people just look a bit more sleepy and maybe makes us feel a bit better. But we, we, delirium may still be going on in their head. So back to Mike. Um, so what do we what do we do now? And I've missed out his uh, steroids there on the medicines. Sorry. OK, so we did get some bloods done. They showed a high calcium that 3.3 is really quite high. So what now? What are we going to do for Mike now? So lots of you would know that um, if we think it's appropriate, high calciums um, can be treated on a temporary basis reasonably successfully, but that does require intravenous infusions of medicines and therefore would, would require an acute admission. And so that's about sort of deciding whether that's appropriate for the clinical situation, talking to, uh, talking to Mike if he can, can talk to you about it, his friends and family, and then trying to think what might be in his best interests. So just in terms of treating high calciums, is treatment appropriate? Just stop and think. So it does sound like it may well be appropriate to consider acute admission for Mike, doesn't it? And to try to treat his calcium and reverse his acute confusion if we could. Um, but for some people who are perhaps much closer towards the end of their life, if you think about the trajectories, they may well be in their last few days or short weeks and may be dying. And it's it's not necessarily just treating the numbers of the blood, just stop and think if trying to treat a high calcium in those patients would be the right thing to do, because it would mean um, an acute hospital admission or hospice admission. It'd be moving them from perhaps their preferred place of care. It would be potentially invasive treatments such as putting in IV lines and things. And uh, for somebody who's very close towards the end of their life, it might mean that they, they don't therefore recover and have to stay in that setting where you have sent them and, and pass away there, which might not have been their wish. So just have a think about whether treatments are appropriate. Yeah, and you're, then, tw you're at 20 minutes. OK, I'm done. I just got the final slide there with some, some resources that might be useful in terms of delirium. Thank you, Fiona. Perfect timing. Thank you.
just give people a moment just to look at the slides and of course the slides will be available and there's just one comment in the chat before we move on to conservation and Elsa making the very very relevant point that that in residential homes it's often quite common to see residents with UTI and that will manifest itself as as delirium so the the bit around the diagnosis and thinking about causes and reversal causes is is very relevant can I make a suggestion can people, if you've got questions, do please pop them in the chat because we will come back to them later on. But thank you, Joe. Let's move on now to Lisa, who is going to talk about constipation. Thank you so much. So, Lisa, let's just check if we can share your slides and I will do the same thing, which will I will pop up on the screen as we're getting to about 15 minutes, if you are still going. Sorry, just bear with me a second. That's looking hopeful. Is that OK? Um, yep. I can see that on my screen. Can somebody else put a thumbs up in the chat or say if you can see it on your screen? Yeah, I can I, see it. I can see it. Lisa, okay. over to you. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. So my name is Lisa. I'm one of the specialist nurses working in Marie Curie. So thank you, everybody, for having me today. Um, so my slide today is um, about constipation. Um, so to start, I've outlined some objectives um, for my presentation. Um, so I just wanted to define constipation, um, identify, identify probable causes of constipation in our palliative care patients and choose appropriate ways to manage constipation according to the most likely cause. So first of all, what is constipation? So constipation is infrequent bowel evacuations, hard or small um, feces and difficult or painful defecation. About 80% of our patients in palliative care will require laxatives at some point. And this is a subjective symptom. So it's important to remember that stool frequency does vary in the normal population. Some people might go to the toilet every day. Some people it might be two to three days. So it's always important to remember that what is the norm for us is not necessarily the norm for our patients. And so some complications of constipation, it can cause pain, colic like pain or constant pain, um, urinary retention or frequency, faecal impaction, overflow diarrhea, um, and it can cause abdominal distension um, uh, and can potentially cause a um, bowel obstruction or can indicate a bowel obstruction as opposed to causing it. Um, I think this is my old slide, so I am sorry, I've slightly edited this, so just bear with me. So why are our patients more prone to constipation? So the um, so the, our patients, obviously, they're palliative. Um, they sometimes have reduced mobility, um, poor nutrition, decreased fluid intake. They may have hypercalcemia or hypokalemia. Some of the medications that we prescribe our patients, um, so opioid medications, that slows the bowel down and that can cause constipation. Some anti-sickness medicines like ondansetron, um, some treatments that our patients might be having like chemotherapy, that can cause constipation. Um, so it's just to be aware that some medications that our patients are prescribed can be a cause. Again, some of our patients might have difficulty accessing toilets quickly due to weakness or fatigue or paraplegia. Some of our patients need carer assistance and therefore, you know, if they're waiting for their carers to arrive, you know, three or four times a day, their bowel movements may not be in sync with that. Um, and obviously, if they're holding themselves, that means that they're more prone to becoming constipated. And things like embarrassment, you know, our patients are sometimes in public settings if they're in hospital or in the hospice or even embarrassment in their own homes. You know, some patients really dislike using commodes um, and therefore, you know, they may be unlikely to say that they need to use the toilet because they don't want to use the commode. They're embarrassed by it. Um, so, again, these are some reasons why um, our patients may end up constipated and some patients um, may get pain on defecation as well. And that can make them, you know, hold it in not want to go to the toilet. So again, these are things to, to bear in mind. Um, so preventing constipation, obviously asking, is the is my patient at risk of constipation? Um, and if yes, we should look to potentially establish a laxative regime or at least have laxatives in place. So if the patient does start getting symptoms or signs of constipation, then they can um, implement that laxative regime. 
Um, so managing constipation. So first of all, we need to identify the cause and the mechanism for the constipation, um, investigate and treat reversible causes, um, looking at non-drug treatments as well as drug treatments. So managing constipation. <clears throat> so it's really important to take a good history with our patients. So as I mentioned earlier, it's knowing what's normal for your patient. So you might go into a patient and, you know, ask them how are your bowels and they'll say, yeah, I have my bowels open every three to four days. That might be to you. You might think, oh, my goodness, does that mean they're constipated? Are they struggling to go? But actually, their bowel movements are soft. The consistency is OK. They're having no issues actually passing it, no pain. Um, you know, so that might just be what's normal for them. Um, it's worth asking them, like I said, their last bowel movement, when was it, what was the consistency? I have put the Bristol stool chart on the next slide so that, you know, if they say to you that the stool is really difficult to pass, it's taken me a long time to get it out. When it comes out, it's very small and it's hard and it's dry. You know they're constipated. If they say that it's nice and soft and it's coming away easily, then you know that, you know, their bowels are working OK. Um, are they passing wind? Do they have bowel sounds? And that indicates that their bowels are working OK. They may just need a little bit of a helping hand. Are there any concerning factors? So does the patient have bowel cancer or any peritoneal disease or any disease that you worry that might cause an obstruction? Do they have any bone metastases, any spinal? Um, yeah, any bone metastases, any reason to be concerned for a metastatic spinal cord compression? It's just having these sort of things in your mind. You know, if you're going into a patient that is palliative um, and they let you know, I think sometimes discussing your bowel movements can be a bit embarrassing. We do have a tendency in palliative care. It's one of the things that we ask our patients every time that we review them. Um, so it does, I think it does take the sort of embarrassment out of it. Um, but, you know, district nurses and carers going in to see their patients, you're seeing them every day. They may be more inclined to tell you if they've been having issues with their bowels. Um, you know, if they feel that they're more likely to share these things with you. So it's just being aware that, you um, you know, it might not just be something that can be managed med with medicines. And, you know, there are things, like I said, um, that we need to be aware of. So, you know, bowel um, obstructions and um, spinal cord compression. Looking at any medications that they're taking, are they actually taking laxatives at the moment? Have they taken any previously? Should they be taking laxatives regularly? Um, are the medications that they're taking, are they particularly constipating? So things like morphine, that slows the bowel down. Um, so is, the, you know, if they recently started taking cocodamol, if they recently started taking morphine, oromorph, are they on iron tablets, things like that? Could that be um, the reason that the patients are constipated? And if the patients are being started on these sort of medications as well, is it worth putting a laxative regime in place just to make sure that we can prevent constipation as opposed to um, treating it when it's already happened? Are they eating? Are they drinking? And are they mobile? Are they moving around? Um, again, some patients, you might speak to them and they um, they might say, oh, I, I've never been much of a drinker. I don't drink much water in the day. And it's trying to, um, you know, get them to drink more if they can eat more, you know, eat more um, nutritious food, things that um, have got more fibre in them just to get them a little bit more regular. And do they have any pain when pass when going to the toilet? So that's my that's the Bristol stool chart. And it's good to have an awareness of this. I think it's um is something that's very much drummed into nurses, um, especially in the hospital. And I found as a student as well. So I think we could probably all say what each stage of the Bristol stool chart is without looking at that. But it's always worth um, having it there to have a look at. So some non-pharmacological management of constipation. So as I've already mentioned, increasing fluid intake, um, increasing fruit and fibre in patients' diets. Prunes are really good, um, a really good fruit for um, for our patients to to take. Some patients are very funny with taking medicines, um, and they'll say, "Oh, I'd rather not take medications if I can help it." So, you know, these are the sort of things that I would be talking to patients about before going straight for laxatives if I felt that um, they needed, you know, some advice. Um, getting them in the right position when they go into the toilet as well. I think a lot of people don't recognise that actually if you raise your feet and lean forward slightly, as you can see in, um, in at the bottom of this slide, that's the correct position to be in when you're having your bowels open. Um, so again, it's just explaining that to patients. You know, sometimes they have razors on the toilet seat. If they can't stand properly and our OTs have gone in and they've put a razor um, on the toilet seat, then they're in an even more compromising position to have their bowels open. So they might just need a step or 
stall in front of them to raise their legs to help get them into that proper position. Um, and as I said previously, reviewing their medications. So there are a number of laxative combinations that can be um, effective. Again, remembering patient preference, some patients don't like to take tablets. They might not, you know, maybe they are overwhelmed with how many tablets they're already taking in a day and they don't want to add something extra in. Um, but it also, you know, they may have taken laxatives previously that they think that work for them, that they prefer. Um, but it is important to try and keep the medications to a minimum. So hence trying to figure out what the problem is um, and what type of um, laxative would work for that patient so that you're not trying lots of different medicines at a time and, you know, event overwhelming the patients. Um, prescribing a separate softener and a separate stimulant that allows for titration of those components and can give the optimum stall frequency and consistency. Being aware of things like Senna because they can cause colic, colic type pains in patients because Senna stimulates the bowel. Um, so again, it's just being aware that, you know, if a patient's saying they've got constipation and you start them on something like Senna um, and then they're complaining that they've got this the, you know really bad tummy cramps then it could be the Senna that's causing it so it's just to be aware um, and again considering the route of administration could the patient manage enough fluid to tolerate something like Laxido would they actually be able to drink that much um, would they be able to manage the tablets better do they dislike the taste because ultimately you could give a patient as many medicines as you want, put things in place. But if they decide that they don't like it, they're not going to take it. And if they don't take it, then obviously you're not going to help them. So it's just bearing the patient in mind. So these are some different types of laxatives. Um, so you've got bulk forming laxatives that basically just adds bulk to the stool and can help to stimulate the bowel, but it's not something that we would prescribe regularly. Um, you've got softeners um, that um, help to soften the stool, osmotic laxatives, so that just draws some water and fluid into the stool to help soften it to get it moving, and stimulant laxatives, things like Senna, um, they help to stimulate the bowel, get the bowel moving. So as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you might prescribe um, Senna in um, if you prescribe a patient morphine or a patient's been put on morphine, their bowel slows down and they become a bit constipated. Something like Senna can help to, stim to stimulate the bowel and speed the bowel up. Um, so it's uh, it's just bearing in mind the reasons why your patient might be constipated and trying to manage the constipation based on those reasons. Um, we do obviously have some rectal laxatives we can use. They are sometimes necessarily, sorry, they are sometimes necessary, but they shouldn't take the place of oral laxatives, which should be used in the first instance. And it's also bearing in mind that, you know, if you're going to prescribe a rectal laxative or get a rectal laxative prescribed, that the patient should have a PR first. Um, and again, bearing in mind the, you know, the type of disease the patient has um, and whether it is appropriate. Um, again, so these are just some notes for the end of my slide to say consider how quickly the laxatives might take to work. So some laxatives the patient would need to take more regularly in order to get it to work. Um, and it might take a couple of days for them to actually kick in and actually start working. So they're not necessarily going to provide um, effective relief straight away. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Laxatives, especially if constipation is an ongoing issue or the reason behind the constipation is an ongoing issue, they should be taken regularly. If a patient is prone to, um, it, so if a patient has got something like a bowel cancer and you worry that they might get obstructed, ensuring that they've got a good laxative regime in place to prevent that from happening is important. Um, and if you do suspect a bowel obstruction, so again, if a patient's got bowel cancer or any type of um, sort of abdominal disease that you think um, they could be at risk of a bowel obstruction, um, it's just seeking medical, uh, seeking specialist advice in that scenario. So if there are any other symptoms and you're concerned that it's not just constipation, there's something else going on, ensuring that you um, seek specialist advice. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Lisa. Thank you so much. And I've just put again a reminder in the chat just to say, folks, if you've got sort of particular questions, if you're looking after patients with particular constipation problems, um, do feel free just to stay on after our last presentation and, and ask questions about that. I think you're absolutely right, Lisa. I think sometimes we we really 
underestimate the impact that it can have and it can be simple geography about how things are laid out in people's homes commodes are fantastic we mm -hmm. cannot do without them but it's just a question of is the commode in the middle of the sitting room or in the middle of the kitchen and and actually can we help to create that sense of privacy so all sorts of things to to think about Thank you so much. You. We will relay quest we will relay questions to you after the event as well. Um, but I'm going to move on in the interest of time if that's all right. That's and great. just thank you so much. Introduce Catriona as our final speaker who's going to talk about, about breathlessness. So wonderful. So uh, Lisa, I think we need you to slop, stop 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 sharing your slides so mm -hmm. that Catriona can share her slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah uh, they're hopefully just coming seconds. out. How do I do that? Um, in there, there we are. Oh, We've stopped oh, one. Great, Perfect. thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. That's wonderful. Katriana, mm -hmm. do you want to just move a slide on so that we know that you're? Yes, Is that you're right? can you see that? Okay? Wonderful, we can. Over to Lovely. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Great stuff. So, my name is Catriona. I'm one of the nurses down at City Hospice. So we support uh, people in their own home with palliative care. So it's going to be a whistle stop tour of managing breathlessness in the palliative patient. So we've got a couple of aims. We'll just quickly, um, ooh, I've gone too fast. So we just want to have a general understanding of breathlessness and its impact on the palliative patient, understand how to assess breathlessness and to explore both non-pharmacological and pharmacological uh, methods of managing this for our patients. So uh, what is breathlessness? So it's a subjective experience. OK, so it would be very different for everyone. It is general breathing discomfort, but an awful lot of people will describe it as being a very intense and sometimes a very scary experience. A lot of people find breathlessness um, can be worse than pain um, because they can almost feel um, like death is impending on them. So they can feel very threatened and frightened by it. It can obviously vary in intensity and there's usually a multifactorial uh, pathophysiology going on behind the breathlessness. You'll usually find when you're meeting people early in their journey that um, breathlessness will often present um, early on as maybe breathlessness on exertion. So they're doing tasks around the house, maybe they're struggling to catch their breath. They sit down, they catch their breath for five minutes, their breathing settles down. Over time, that's going to get worse and that's going to deteriorate and it may come to the point where they become breathless at rest. The biggest thing is this is going to impact on the person's quality of life and it may well have a big impact on how um, they are within their own social circle, within their family, as they lose their independence, as they begin to physically decondition um, due to the breathlessness impacting on their ability to do daily tasks and maybe go out and about. Um, and this can make people feel very isolated, very anxious, which obviously can then exacerbate the breathlessness. Got a lovely little diagram here, which I'm not going to linger on too much, uh, but you can see the slides. But it's just looking at um, the different parts of the, the brain and the body that are responsible for um, the sensation of breathlessness. So it's not just about the physical action and the brain stimulating breathing, but it's also looking at the frontal lobes um, and the anxiety element. The awareness of your own breathing can also then impact um, on the breathlessness. So I'm just very aware of the time there. So how prevalent is it in our patients? So in patients with lung cancer, you'll probably find about over 90% of our patients will ha suffer some element of breathlessness. Uh, but any advanced cancer of any diagnosis, you'll find over 50% of patients will um, report breathlessness. And that's often due to fatigue and general deconditioning as they become more frail. People with COPD, emphysema, that umbrella term, 90 to 95% of patients are going to report breathlessness. Um, heart disease, we see um, 60 to 90%, see a lot of renal disease. Obviously, if people have got recurrent infections, that can lead to breathlessness. And the vast majority of patients with MND, this isn't an exclusive list, but it's just interesting to get a feel for the types of patients you might see with that. Right, there we go. 
So first thing we need to do is we want to sit down and assess our, our breathless patients. So we will need to take a good history. So we need to look at what is um, happening with the breathlessness, where, where, what's happening with the onset. Are we having episodes of breathlessness or is it continuous? Are they breathless at rest or is it just when they're doing activities? Do they have any associated symptoms? So do they have chest pain? Do they have tight feeling chest? Do they have an associated cough that might exacerbate things? Are they bringing up any blood, so hemoptysis? Do they have any added breath sounds such as stride or, or wheeze? Um, obviously, we're hoping to take a pulse oximetry, which I'm hoping the district nurses will have. And obviously, if you've got someone who can listen to chest sounds, that's also very helpful. And if you've got someone who's breathless on exertion, I would be wanting to check their oxygen levels at rest and when they're doing an activity and look to see whether those oxygen levels are changing at all. Look and see if there's any exacerbating factors, but also look and see what they do to manage it to help relieve the breathlessness. So do they sit down and rest? Do they pace themselves? Are there any medications or anything else that they may use to help manage it? Which comes actually to my bottom point there with the coping strategies. Do they have any anxiety or depression? Um, I don't know if any of you here for last week's slides when we were talking about pain and we talked about total pain. So with breathlessness, again, it's very much an holistic assessment. We look at the whole person again because any kind of psychosocial elements can have a big impact on someone's sensation of breathlessness. So having a look at things like low mood, any elements that could be causing anxiety, the environment, what is their flat like or their home like? Do they have mould? Is it damp? Is it warm enough? Um, what's the social situation like? Do they have any care to help them with activities of daily life? Do they have any other medical history that might be impacting um, with their breathlessness as well? And ge a general medical history. So have a look at what medications they're on and see if there's anything that might be either contributing to it or anything that we can use to help manage the breathlessness. Did you have anything to add there, James? Nope. I've got James in the corner here. <laughs> I'm, I'm an apparition. Okay. So we should always have a little consideration of investigations, and I've put a little caveat in the back there, excuse me. <laughs> so as um, Joe had said earlier, whenever we're considering investigations in palliative care patients, we need to look at how that person is doing. We also need to consider if they've made any particular decisions about what they would want treated. So have they made any ceilings of treatment? So if it is appropriate to do investigations, if it's going to change how we support the person, then it may be that we need to consider some of these. So do we need to have a look at a, a chest X-ray and see if there's anything like a pleural effusion causing or an infection that, that's causing the breathlessness? Has someone got an anemia? So if someone's blood level has gone low and that's actually contributing to their breathlessness. Are they an asthmatic or a COPD patient? Do we need to be monitoring their peak flows to see what their, their general lung function is like? Is there a cardiac history? So do we need to do an ECG and have a little look to see actually, is there something cardiac going on that's um, contributing to their breathlessness? And same with the echo there. Uh, CTPAs, so PEs, things like that. Having a look to look around, but again, if we're not going to change, if these investigations aren't going to change how we support the patient, or if we think they're actually imminently dying, why are we putting people through these things? So as Joe said earlier, stop and think before we go ahead with investigations. So management, if we can manage any reversible causes. So, you know, if there's an infection or a hypoxia, do we need to get them antibiotics? Do we need to consider giving them oxygen? Do they want to go in for blood transfusion? SVCO, if you're not familiar with it, is a palliative complication for people typically with a lung cancer. So super vena cava obstruction. Um, and that's where the tumour presses normally against a major um, vein in the, the pulmonary system, which can then lead to breathlessness. And that needs an acute management. Um, pulmonary embolism, pericardial effusions, things like this. So do we need to reverse any of these? Some of these may need admission to hospital and then it's seeing if that's something that the person does want us to do. 
So looking at the non-pharmacological management, so um, there's a few different things that we can do. So there's very good evidence that fan therapy is very effective for breathlessness management. So we've got sensors all around the upper lip and around the nose, which actually direct straight back to our respiratory centre. And when they feel movement, they help the respiratory the spiritual centre basically tells the body to slow down and relax the breathing down. So having a small handheld fan and using about 15 to 20 centimetres away from the face helps to relax that breathing and reduce that sensation of breathlessness. If they're under someone like the, um, the lung function team at the land dock, they may have had pulmonary rehabilitation, rehabilitation um, support from that. ROT does things like Be Inspired, which is looking through breathing techniques and other management techniques that people can use to get on top of their breathlessness. Some people struggle to lie flat at night, um, so positioning is very good and that goes the same in the day. So if you're going out to see someone and they say they struggle to sleep at night because of their breathing, do they need a bed rest or do we need to consider, you know, supporting them with pillows or even a hospital bed? Energy conservation, I think I've written conversation there. Conservation is really important as well, because when you're tired, you're more prone to getting breathless. So making sure people are pacing themselves, make sure they've got access to mobility aids and things like that, so that they're not getting too tired when, um, when they are exerting themselves. And then things like the complementary therapy, so reflexology, acupuncture, hypnotherapy, they can all be used to help relax, especially if there's an element of anxiety with the breathlessness, they can help relax those down. And if there's a lot going on, sometimes from a psychological point of view, sometimes counselling can be really helpful. So from a pharmacological point of view, um, the gold standard would normally be morphine. So we tend to start 1.25 mils in the community. Sometimes in the community, we just go for one mil. It's really helpful for just reducing that breathing rate down. And sometimes we find using it, say, 20 to 30 minutes before whatever I say is a predictable task that makes someone breathless. It can help reduce that sensation of breathlessness. You do need to manage people's expectations that it's not going to completely eliminate that breathlessness, but it hopefully would make things more manageable. OK, if someone's needing it quite regularly, sometimes a low dose sustained uh, morphine, long acting morphine tablet can be helpful. There's less clinical evidence for oxycodone, but if someone can't tolerate morphine, then anecdotally, I found it quite helpful mm. for, for people. Um, with breathlessness that can't manage the morphine. And obviously always make sure you've got your laxative and your anti-sickness. You can use benzodiazepines such as lorazepam and diazepam for people who have a very clear anxiety element, but these really should be used with caution. Um, there can be an element of addiction with any of these medications, but also they're very sedating. Um, so we need to be very careful we're using them, especially in our frail patients. If people have got an element of anxiety or low mood that's contributing to it, we may want to consider antidepressants. Um, and I do, I am very aware of the time, but I do want to very quickly just talk about oxygen. So people can often think that oxygen is going to be benefit with great benefit with uh, breathlessness. But there's not always great evidence to say that this is going to be helpful. Actually, things like fan therapy and using the other medications and other techniques are usually more helpful. We can't have it in a house where someone is still actively smoking. Um, so we need to look if someone is dropping their oxygen levels when they're uh, mobilising. That's usually the main reason why we will get it in place. But it needs to be as um, needs to be a clear assessment and double check that it's actually the most appropriate thing to put in place and discuss it with the GP or palliative team. And then I was just going to very briefly touch on breathlessness at the end of life. So anticipatory medications we always get in place. So it's things like getting your opioid again, getting your benzodiazepine, which is your midazolam, and then managing people's medication uh, secretions, using the hospital bed to keep people at a 30 degree angle and make sure they've got good mouth care. A little added note as well, when people are on oxygen therapy, obviously dries their nose out. So to keep make sure those nose, nasal mucous membranes stay nice and um, hydrated, using things like the biotin or balanced gel is really helpful. It's water-based, so it's safe to use with oxygen. 
Um, but I would just make sure things stay really comfortable. And that was very much a whistle stop tour of breathlessness. I do apologise, it felt a bit rapid there. That's it from me. <laughs> Catriona, thank you. A two o'clock on the nail on my computer. And thank you so much. Some really, I think the, corroll the corollary, I can't say that now, between the total pain issues that were discussed last week and that in a sense the impact of breathlessness using that total pain framework I think is 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 terribly useful and lots of the top tips the non-pharmacological management um I just before asking if people have got particular questions please let re me remind you here's the QR code for our evaluation um it's terribly important for us to know how we can help develop these series of webinars for colleagues in the future. So thank you so much for that. Um, before I come back to breathlessness, just next week, we're pulling some of the threads together really from this, from today and last week and the first webinar. And next week's webinar is around the collaboration, collaborative working to help support people with palliative care needs particularly around the district nursing input and and just how how it can work, how it can work effectively together. What can we all do to help support each other? So that's the focus of next week's webinar. I'm conscious of time. It's two o'clock and I know many of you will have things that you need to go and do, but we will be staying on the call. So if people want to ask particular questions around some of these symptoms, then do please feel free to stay on and ask those questions. But otherwise, I would again just like to say thank you so much to all three of our speakers, to Joe Hayes, to Lisa and to Catriona for their contributions today and for making us think and making us think differently about these symptoms. I'm going to stay on the call, but please feel free, head off and take care in this slightly foggy, cold, foggy.